Hello, superhumans, and welcome to this fabulous Fane online event. My name is Alex Fox, and I'm going to be interviewing comedian, writer, and broadcaster Sadia Asma, who's the author of the new memoir, Sex Bomb. Although it's more of like a memoir. <laughs> 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 I love that you laughed at that, Sadia. That that brings me joy. Um, it is a laugh out loud funny book in multiple ways, but it also deals with some of the darker, sadder and, and more anger inducing realities of trying to live and love as a British Indian Muslim woman born in Essex uh, to parents who met in Delhi. Now, just to explain the title briefly, Firstly, Sadia herself is a sex bomb, full of explosive erotic energy that she hasn't always been sure how to direct. That sexuality has also been weaponized against her, like a bomb, by different sectors of society. She's dropped her own disastrous sex bombs in the form of mistakes and mishaps that have inevitably happened as she's tried to carve out her, uh, her own path through intimacy without any real roadmap. Uh, and it's also a pun about bombing on stage and, and in her career and how the moments when you feel like you're dying can actually teach you a lot about being alive and staying alive. Um, so without further ado, let's say hello to the woman who is the bomb in every aspect of that word, Sadia Asmat. Hello. Hi. Oh my god, that was such a nice intro. Thank you. And I was also thinking like because terrorism obviously gets a lot in the news. And I'm <laughs> like, wait a wait a minute, guys. <laughs> what about the big S bomb like that nobody talks about? Like we have too busy worrying about extremism most of the time. Well, we'll talk about all sorts of terrors, both macro and micro, that you discuss in your book. Um, but first up. I, I just I have to talk about this. Um, you recently had a run in with somebody who is bigger than the rocks that we wear on our fingers, bigger than than rock as a musical movement. The one, the only Chris Rock, right? Yeah. Oh, my God, Alex. So last Thursday um, at the Royal Albert Hall, I watched um, Chris Rock. And then I was like, I had one copy of my proof of sex bomb left. And I thought, I don't know what's going to happen, but I'm going to put it in my purse and see. So when I got to the venue, I spoke to this really lovely lady called, uh, I don't know if I can say her name, but I'll say her name is Sean. And I asked her really nicely. I said, do you think we could get this to Chris Rock? And she said, let me see what I can do she went away and then she came back and she um basically yeah so she took the book she went away and she came back and then she said they want you to write a message to Chris Rock I wrote a message to Chris Rock and then they she took it back to his team and then she brought it back and said actually do you want to write a bit more about yourself because that the first message was obviously me being a fan and just like um thanking him for being the inspiration that he has been. And so, yeah, um, my book is currently with Chris Rock. Now, this feels like karma because in Sex Bomb, you talk about uh, a real book <laughs> where you tried to get um, a cuddly toy and a letter to Chris Rock much earlier in your life. Uh, and then they would return to you in the post with a, a kind of dismissive note saying, um, Mr. Rock is not ready to be rocked by your presence. <laughs> Yeah, I think um, it's, um, you know, because it was like fan mail and um, I think the American laws are really strict about like them being able to take other material and stuff and like it's just super complicated. So I can imagine um, it wasn't even his decision or it didn't even get close to him. Um, and so I was really scared last Thursday because like it's so close to my book coming out and who needs more rejection, Alex? Who needs it? <laughs> but then like part of life is about just going for things and um, it was just worth it. The show was brilliant and it just meant so much to me that he accepted um, my gift. This is also an achievement on multiple levels because <laughs> if we look at the facts here, you as a Muslim hijabi managed to get a piece of material with the word bomb on it to a celebrity. <laughs> That's Alex, tough. <laughs> literally, literally you hit the nail on the head and um, I think I think we're moving. We're clearly COVID has helped us get into Muslim friendlier places and times, which is fantastic. Not that I'm wishing any further pandemics on anybody. <laughs> well, uh, that's an interesting thing to say. You think um, 
in the last two years I've, I've made people maybe a little bit more a little bit more understanding of people from from different cultures well we've all been I locked think what, what happened <laughs> Muslims have been on lockdown for a lot longer than the world and now that the world understands what lockdowns are like maybe there's uh-huh. more empathy towards Muslims because we've had curfews and you know we've had to wear masks all our lives right so maybe it's <laughs> no I'm just kidding but you know <laughs> It makes a lot of sense to me. Um, By the way, just to explain to the audience, um, I do realise the irony of talking (laughs) a lot about sexual liberation from literally inside the closet right now. (laughs) Not set the tone in any way for our chat. Um, So let's discuss the book itself. Um, I, I guess a good place to start is with the very first word on the very first page, which is once, and which immediately links to the first in a series of very helpful and hilarious explanatory footnotes, which are designed to provide extra info about cultural matters to clueless white gals like me. Um, But you also warn that Sex Bomb is not a guide to all things Islam. Uh, Instead, this is your unique story and reflection, Sadia. And Some brown folks will definitely identify with bits of it and that's important. And some white folks will get new insights and learnings and that's important. Sex Bomb is gonna speak in important ways to many humans, but I really got the sense that you didn't write this intending to speak for anyone but yourself, right? Absolutely. So Alex, first, let me correct you. You know so much about um, cultural uh, nuances. So um, and, and and the fact that you've picked up on the, that very intricate detail is just testimony to, to how profound you are. And yes, absolutely. Um, couldn't write for anybody but my story. Um, it, it's just I think it comes out more in the book, but I wouldn't even know who to start with to, to kind of appeal to. I, I, I When I um, thought about this, it's more that your audience tends to pick you rather than you picking your audience. Um, and I think that, um, yeah, as you say, I'm hoping that it will appeal to many people. Part of the footnotes as well is because I really would like conversations to move forward. And whilst we're, if we're still in a place where we're just asking those basic questions, um, how will we ever be able to push forward and, and kind of move together, closer together? Yeah, I found it really useful that you just very quickly gave some definitions of certain words. Uh, And I find that a lot in my own work as well. Sometimes if we're using language that isn't immediately understood, even if perhaps it should be by people educating themselves, sometimes um, that can create a prohibitive barrier to further understanding and we just don't move forward as as far as we'd like to. Um, But that kind of, those educational tools aside and and your very generous provision of those simple baby steps for those who need them. Um, One thing that I absolutely loved about this book is how nuanced it is. Um, I I, I love how packed with um, unflinching ability to, to really dissect very difficult topics in so much depth you have. Um, I am troubled by the idea that I feel like we're in an era right now where a lot of people, especially online, feel drawn or maybe even pushed to trying to really oversimplify things and and make them exceedingly binary and assume that X is absolutely wrong Mm. and Y is absolutely right. When the inconvenient truth, as you discuss in so many ways in this book, is that there are loads of shades of grey and they aren't as alluringly hardline to talk about. I think... um, being honest about the difficult complexities of everything rather than just nodding along with those top line simplified ideas is is really important. Thank you for picking up on that Alex and I really really hope a lot of people um, can kind of feel comfort in in me owning my own kind of mistakes if you like um, and feeling like we can move towards a less judgmental space in those terms. I really feel like it's important. Um, I think it's a lot influenced by my stand-up comedy where obviously you're not, well, I don't approach the comedy in a way to try to be popular. I really try to try to get to truths and obviously then make Mm. them funny or, you know, it doesn't have to strictly always be in that order. But I think that's where the place where I was coming from is I wanted to tell, um, 
you know, I, I really learned from comedy a long time ago that, you know, you think telling the truth is easy, but when you really um, unpack what that means, uh, it's not as straightforward. And so, yeah, I just wanted to be quite frank and, and own up to, you know, because you can't just like take shots. You, you know what they say, right? Don't dish it out if you can't take it yourself. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Um, do you think uh, more people do need to interrogate some concepts like um, the idea that feminism is great universally and patriarchy is bad 100%? Do you think people maybe need to ask more questions about that like you do in the book? It is about critical thinking, absolutely, yes. So I think, um, as you quite politely indicated, I think online is is a great space uh, sometimes, but sometimes it doesn't... Uh, I think it's really polarising it as well. And so I think we should try to, try to be self-aware, basically, which is what I was trying to do in the book. And, um, yeah, I think people who want to capitalise off certain issues, maybe this won't be great news to them but um other people who who feel like maybe they're being subjected to these things could definitely do with thinking in different ways so that they don't get played all the time but because some people are so empathetic and um it can just be quite draining all the time and you do have to protect yourself as well and so there's only so much battles that you can kind of take on plus you have your own life right so <laughs> Yeah, and some of the battles that we're told we should be fighting under certain terms, when you dig into those as an individual, you can sometimes find that um, you are, you're not being served by them as well as you should be. For example, you talk about how um, there's a big push for a lot of people to just um, to nod along with the idea of, of predominantly white feminism and there can be backlash if they raise questions or, or um, ask whether all of that is right for them. When in fact, there is an irony, isn't there, in that um, a lot of, some of this movement that purports to liberate women for, like British Indian Muslim women is actually white women telling them what they should do and think, which doesn't yeah. sound very liberating to me. No, um, I, I, I think that it's, it's difficult because nobody tells you that from the get go. And it's a, it is a, a kind of educational piece for, for the Asians involved. Um, and it's a shame because certain kind of facets of it are, are kind of like easy to go along with, if you like. But then when you see the detail behind it and some of the politics behind it, and then when you unfortunately pull, pull it down and, and realise that actually there's a lot more going on here and your interests aren't really being catered for, um, it's just not nice feeling like the joke's on you or that you're a fool. So I definitely think, as you as we've said, is that people, people can take ownership for their own individual development and learning, as opposed to feeling like they have to go go along with what's what's popular or the narrative at the time, because often these things are just older things being reinvented. Mm -hmm. I think there's a lot of passion from these groups and good intention perhaps sometimes a lack of compassion and ability to think about things from different points of view and recognize that there is more than one way to live a good and liberated life for yourself because we are all different and difference can be a great thing. Um, I feel like we've really dived into the deep end here and I, I don't want to drown you too early on. <laughs> So let's kind of wind it back a little bit. Um, at the beginning of the book, you, you talk a lot about how um, your upbringing and the messages that you were given uh, from the communities around you and wider society uh, really shaped your own self-identity and self-worth or, or lack of, really. Um, and I noticed a lot of contradictory and conflicting messages that you were receiving. So um, maybe we can dissect some of those yeah um Alex it was very confusing <laughs> so it was uh you know I think you've hit the nail on the head right now um, it was very contradictory so um you know I was both not allowed to use my sexuality but fundamentally um led to understand that that was the the kind of selling point about me if you like um to uh invest in or like to you know use for marriage or with to kind of improve my social standing, if you wish. Um, and that wasn't like something I ever felt 
a pressure to kind of act upon, but it was always there. Um, and it's difficult to, to understand what to do with because um, there's all of these different things going on about being a good girl, whatever that means. <laughs> um, but also being um, all of these other things like uh, acceptable or, um, and it was never about being loved. It was, you know, that, and, and then, so the Western narratives would then kind of show you this far more softer kind of version of love. And then that was very uh, aspirational, if you like. Um, but I was never taught that I should kind of either love myself or, or desire that or it always felt like um, I was on the outside of that and so it was it was quite difficult trying to feel where I would fit in best because I never really wanted an arranged marriage I never felt that that was right for me mainly because I have this is going to sound really horrible so I don't know if they're going to keep this in but like because I speak good English <laughs> and um, it, I don't know if like being educated was uh, important, if you like, uh, or or it felt as though being educated could be an escape from that. So I felt that that could be a way out of that potential scenario for me. And so if I kept my head in the books, then maybe um, uh, I would have a different life. But I think the difficult thing is if you feel uh, you got opted out of something, there's always something in you, like the rebel or something that's kind of curious about it. And so why can't I have love? And then it kind of like, I mean, I think I was okay until I got like two degrees or something. I'm joking. I didn't have no degrees, but um, it is just hard feeling like you're boxed out. Of many degrees of greatness, Sadia. <laughs> <laughs> that's so sweet. Thank you. <laughs> but yeah, so um, I just feel like people should be entitled to love basically. And, and that's definitely not a narrative that I felt. Um, I felt like, you know, all of these other things like a wife, when I never had a husband or a homemaker when I never had a home and uh, you know all of these responsible things to be able to look after my family um uh to be you know educated and and so you know the the kind of more head headstrong aspects but in terms of leaning into the heart aspects which is just as important um I felt I had to be quite strong and and thick-skinned um and just kind of distance myself from that because if I show too much interest um it could be misconstrued that I wanted an arranged marriage because that was the only type of marriage um other than on like the tv but like they wore white dresses we wore red dresses in our wedding so again it was just not described to me that if I wanted to have a white dress for example I could but the color of your dress doesn't mean uh it doesn't make the marriage <laughs> if that makes uh -huh. sense. um I remember uh you writing that you didn't learn to make a cup of tea because you were so worried that, <laughs> that would be construed as you trying to learn a skill that would make you a good wife and thus show your enthusiasm for uh, any type of marriage which you were really questioning at the time um and you you talk about this difficulty of um so much trust needing to be placed in elders uh, to, to teach you and, and, to, and to guide you and, and by these traditional structures of, um, of, of, try, of trying to help you get into what would hopefully be a, a happy marriage. Like the, there is just so much trust there, but your own parents um, were tricky models, weren't they really? I mean, your, your mom had... <laughs> lots of mental health challenges the way your dad modeled relationships and quote unquote love was extremely problematic and so that you were having to you're being told that you had to trust these people and listen to them but what you were seeing didn't maybe feel good to you no um and also the thing is is that my parents almost from a very young age uh, kind of gave me the impression they were like you can't handle a relationship so it felt as though they, that was something that wasn't expected of me even though the wider world and society would think that all I was capable was of marriage so again another contradiction um, and so you know when you're very young you kind of don't even know what you're missing out on so for people to tell you you know you can't have xyz it doesn't it's neither here nor there because I wasn't really pursuing that um but then it, you grow up and then you do get to a point where it it looks appealing and then you just have no skills as to how to go about it you know you've been told that it's really out of your lane um 
on so many fronts, not just in the house, but outside of the house. Um, and then obviously uh, the way that people would look at me as well. Um, you know, I, I don't know if, why sometimes they categorize the innocence of a woman, for example, just by sight. Uh, maybe even, you know, to even judge someone's innocence is, is not something that needs to be scrutinized. I don't know. But um, so it, it just felt very complicated. And who wants complications? <laughs> Uh, true, although, as we've also discussed, oversimplification can yes. also be a problem, although I saw aspects of that in the way that you, the pathway that you happen to take as well, like you mentioned that your mum's idea of love was really quite romantic and idealised and she almost loved the idea of it more than the reality of it and um, you heard lots of um, quite vague and um, very beautiful sounding tenets from uh, from your from your religion um, that sounded kind of nice but didn't really give you a, a concrete understanding of, of how you were supposed to live in order to give and receive love in a healthy manner. I think um, yes, people from my parents' generation, um, the way the way that they speak, this is my interpretation from the way that they speak, they seem to say things like that was all we could do. So they had a very limited, um, whether that's a self-imposed limit or not, but they just, I think their focus was on survival. And I think because things have certainly progressed and so we're all touch with like, you know, thriving, we obviously in our generation, we need to do more than that. Now, it's an interesting thing that there's obviously a lot more breakups than they used to be because when people needed to survive um that was a, another reason they would keep the marriage or that relationship even if there were unironed uh undealt with issues um mm -hmm. but yeah i think that there's a lot more uh singletons uh female singletons than ever before in my um kind of community um there's a lot more divorces there's uh it's just not talked about and i think that that's an issue because those are things that we could learn from or we could try to stop, uh, you know, before those situations arise. Um, and it can be very lonely if you're going through something very difficult um, that you feel you're in it on your own or that nobody will understand um, or that doesn't live up to that ideal image of a, of a relationship or marriage that you feel that you're meant to live up to. Um, how do you cope with things like feeling like you're the one to blame as the female? Um, so, yeah, I just think that, you know, I can understand some reasons why people want to be reserved, but I, I also don't feel that that needs to be the precedent. Um, I think that people uh, need to be able to understand that there's people that they can talk to or, or should talk to. I want to talk about the places that we can talk and uh, understanding spaces for people from um, British Indian and, and Muslim backgrounds um, in just a sec. Um, but you also um, talk about singledom there and your own singledom is an interesting thing because it's not entirely a choice or it certainly wasn't earlier in your life. <laughs> Uh, your celibacy and your lack of a partner uh, was uh, interpreted as a, a, a wonderful sign of purity and virtue by some of the people in your community. But you talk about how the fact, actually, your libido was through the roof. Um, you wanted to shake the walls and bang the headboard and you were more horny than um, an entire orgy of rhinos. <laughs> um, and yet you, you know, there was this dichotomy again this conflict this contrast of being perceived as a uh, uh, very admirably almost asexual by some certain elements of your community when you really wanted to get laid like a little free range egg a hundred percent um and i think i think it's a fine line of being desperate alex and i think um you know there's a little bit of pride aspect to it and and just not being smooth like i'm a comedian like we do dumb stuff like we're not i'm not the cool actress who you know just walks into a room and or eyes gaze on her like i'll trip up and just you know have toilet paper stuck to my shoe or something no, not really that bad but you know what i mean mean like I'm just uh, myself and um yeah I think it comes with what you said before as well as in like some people don't know how to deal with um somebody who has you know their shit together but I also think that 
I, I, I'm heavier for men than other women in that I come with, like I'm an Asian, I have a headscarf. So sometimes they'll think, what does she want, a jihadi? Or, you know, <laughs> is she already married? Or she's not going to sleep with me until marriage or whatever. So there's so much preconceptions. And I think that men want an easier route. And there are, obviously, I'm not saying that I'm not easy, <laughs> but um, I'm just, <laughs> um, yeah, I just not think like that. that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I just think that sometimes, um, you know, if, if men men are a lot more simpler than women in many ways, and I think that they probably just wouldn't even think as far as we've just spoken, and um, they, they're just not that bothered. Whereas, like, we're very much emotional creatures as well, and so I'd like to get my emotions involved. Um, but then, like, you know, if they won't even kind of give you more than five minutes, it's it's you know, it's not going to be what you want it to be. So yeah, I think I think it's a it has not always been by choice, but um, I've learned a lot about you know uh, the pitfalls of kind of like seeking acceptance in the arms of somebody else and how ultimately that's not going to really uh, kind of fulfil me really. Yes, and one of the big ways that you learnt about that has the name Ray J. Um, <laughs> a lot. <laughs> A sex bomb goes into a lot of detail about your on-off relationship with this, hesitate to call him a guy, cockroach, cock, (laughs) (laughs) Um, who frankly possesses more red flags than a Labour Party rally going to a bullfight. Um, But as you mentioned in the book, you know, sometimes when you're really in your feelings and when your self-esteem is on the floor and um, your libido means that you really desire to be on the floor, on the bed, under the table, against the wall with somebody, Mm -hmm. then it it can be uh, all too easy to overlook red flags, whether knowingly or subconsciously. Um, Your book does a lot of brave things and makes is very very honest and bold but one of the things that I really really admired was um how much you really laid out uh the 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 mistakes that both you and Ray J maybe made Uh, because you went you went back to him a few times even though he treated you badly and even though you un you you lay out why you did this and all of the things that, that led up to you being in a position where you didn't feel like you loved yourself enough to seek better love than that. Um, I think there will be people out there who will try and shame you and blame you and say, well, why did you go back to him? You brought it on yourself. When you were writing the book, were you worried about those accusations and that kind of shaming? Um, No, uh, to be honest with you, just because um, with stand up, I'm very candid. And um, you know what? I, I, it was more of a learning process for me in terms of the book and, and being honest with myself um, and replaying some of those scenarios um, was helpful in me. I, I think I actually felt more um, like, oh, my God, why did I go back when I was writing it as opposed to in reality? And so it was uh-huh. a really good way of being reflective um, and learning from that. And and if women want to feel like that, then, you know, um, it wasn't the most sensible <laughs> era of my, you know, living being. So, you know, I understand. It's just uh, it's just humans. Like, again, you can make mistakes. But I think it, it, you've talked about it already. It's, it's not loving yourself and having a low self-worth and then telling yourself um, some some problematic messaging like, you know, there's nobody else or um, at least the sex is really good or you know him and da 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 Do you know what I mean? So it's like um, it's, uh, it's definitely a part of my life where I had a lot of learning to do, but I was in denial about that. Um. I think it's really important for people to hear and realise that sometimes that learning process does take time. Um, mm. We've we've chatted briefly about um, online movements and the pressure to say particular things. And I've noticed a, a strand of um, quite sassy attitude online of this like whole kick into the curb, uh, get rid of a man at the first sign of a misdemeanour or or or. Uh, poor behavior and I can see the positives in that but I also wondered whether that might make it more difficult for people to talk about those real life vulnerable times when you don't make the decision to kick that person to the curb for all those complicated reasons you kind of touch upon it by talking about how girl power although it has um, lots of positive aspects as a concept 
might make it more difficult for for women to talk about their, their more delicate aspects and and the the places where they're where they're vulnerable too I think there really needs to be space to talk about vulnerability and making mistakes and uh, having desires that means sometimes that you make uh, the wrong kind of compromises rather yeah. than us all pretending we get it we you know we're strong enough to get it right straight off the bat there is that pressure and I didn't even think of that um, as a shaming but it is and um, hence why I'm really mindful and cautious of those types of dump him straight away um, narratives um, there's a very prominent book out by somebody that I, I you know I don't really support myself and why I would say that is because a lot of reason is a lot of reasons is when you're in um, an unhealthy relationship with yourself um, that type of narrative can make that person more enticing so if people would be like Ray J is so much trouble I'd be like oh my god so turned on by that oh my god I'm sleeping with trouble he's a bad boy and so even if the narrative is the one thing it's no way of telling how it will be kind of like how it, you're, you will kind of um, twist it if you like yourself but also how would you like it if someone just dumped you so quickly without trying um, so you know it works both ways and I would rather someone kind of understood that um, oops I might have done something wrong I want to learn from it and I want to make this work um, so I think you're right like I don't think that that's healthy I think that's a pressure a peer pressure that women are again um, challenged to kind of like uh, you know contend with and then who knows how that can play out in the future if, if it will feel as though it was wrong or too soon or you'll go back you know I just think that without someone knowing anything about your relationship they can't be giving you advice Mm. And you don't really give advice in this book. You more just reflect on your own feelings and experiences. I never, I never felt like you were telling me what I should think and feel at all. Oh, good, uh, good, 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 good. I'm not qualified there. You, <laughs> <laughs> you did affect me. You also made me laugh my tits off. And frankly, there wasn't there a lot there to start with. So get ready for one day now. Gorgeous. <laughs> Bless you. I can use them as like little mobile storage units now. They're like <laughs> um, we both use comedy to um, to break through taboos, to start conversations, and also just because being funny is fun. Yes. Um, but do you think there's any ever a danger of um, having a having a laugh or making a joke out of things that actually have hurt you? Um, look, I think personally. Um, the way I pain is, is really funny and other people's pain is like, you know, it, it, it's definitely something um, I don't know what it is, but it can kind of like make you feel empathy as well. Right. It's like, oh, my God, like there's a human aspect to someone's vulnerability and pain. Um, I know that there are loads of comedians who don't go into their personal um, kind of uh, problems, if you like, or problem situations. But the, the comedians I like um you know tell some really personal things about the losses that they've been through in terms of it being detrimental I think that it can be if you're using it um as a healing process but if you're healed and then you're you you kind of dis distinguish between uh the situation and what you're using it for that's that's a, a much better way of doing that I would say but if you're if you're really going through a bad time and then you're just like I wouldn't recommend using I mean you probably come up with great material and you'd be fire on stage but I wouldn't recommend you using um that scenario um to kind of you know help you get over a situation at that when it's very raw so a little bit of distance from the dick yeah. or whatever else before you start processing it through comedy I guess it's important that it's you saying what's okay to laugh about in your life as well um you, you you tell an anecdote about a mentor that you had for a while called Lucy who laughed at something that you were really feeling terrible about and it it, it struck me as a, a really gutting moment that this person that you thought understood you has just seen you as purely a joke all the time yes um I think it's so difficult when it comes to, uh, so we're talking about the character where it's, you know, like a white saviour thing where, you know, and it comes back to things being nuanced. I think we're just going to be where you said don't, over, well, I said don't overcomplicate, you said don't oversimplify it. And I think here is that people who hurt you can also have good in your life or, or be a source mm. of good in your life. So that's why I think it was also quite painful for me to really write that bit, actually, because, you um, 
I, without that character and um, without that experience in my life, I, I don't know if I would be doing comedy or be sitting here with you, but also, um, you know, feeling like I was just being looked at as a brown person. Um, I just expected more from that person. So, um, again, it's just it's, it's a tricky one. But I think, um, you know, relationships do move on and uh, you can outgrow them. And I think that's an example of, of also of being empowered. Um, whilst I wasn't able to do that quite quickly enough with Ray J, that um, it wasn't functional for me um, to feel used or fetishized or to feel spoken down to um, and then I, I just quite rightfully just felt that this wasn't for me and then walked away from it and um, I really wouldn't want to like I think what was good about that is because my industry is really hard and that you do have to kind of really be a show willing to anybody who's giving offers or, or opportunities and um, I was really proud of myself in that situation for not um, kind of if you want to use the term selling out and trying to just um, get along in comedy I wanted to do it authentically because of um, you know my material my content and my act as opposed to the favors or the friendships that I could capitalize on. It strikes me that a lot of what you work through in the book is finding out where your boundaries should be um, in your personal life and your professional life and sometimes that drawing those boundaries isn't simple and does take time um, regrettable as that is um, your book also weirdly I noticed mentions chicken a hell of a lot <laughs> hot rotisserie guy who works in Asda he's like one of your <laughs> first um, examples of a really attractive dude um, there's your suggestion that you get up to and down to business in the Nando's toilet when you're mm. trying to be creative about your sex life whilst you know not having access to luxury sweets at that point in your existence <laughs> um, and also you talk about you know, all the many things that you have to uh, consider if you're thinking about dating a, a white guy or someone from a different cultural background including that they may not know how to season their meat so there's, there's a lot of chicken references in there but one thing you never ever do is chicken out of being of being really really I keep coming back to this but it's just so honest you have had a little taste of how um challenging and exhausting and uncomfortable it can be when you are honest about things that some people will find controversial in a public domain, like a book, like your comedy, like the article that you wrote that was published in Metro during Ramadan, all about being a sexual being. Um, I, I wondered if you had anything to share about how you care for yourself and keep yourself robust so that you are still able to do work, like put books like this out into the world, um, which sometimes elicit a response that can, can wear you down. Yeah, I think some people thrive on haters, if you like, and I'm yeah. not one of those people. Um, I think that people create a lot of storm about it. But in the words of Cat Williams, who's a great stand up, he's like, haters jobs is to hate. Um, and if I start hating them, I'm going to become one of them. Right. So I don't want to be a hater. That's for, for number one. Mm -hmm. I, I also mentioned in the book how I never really engage with trolls online because they can they just feel like our time is really valuable, Alex, uh, as you know, like and and. and has worth and so that's me giving someone my time um who's really just attacking me or, or you know I, I get so many people like trying to slide into my dms and ask me a question like I'm a tour guide for Asian culture and stuff and I just don't engage that's one way um I think it really helps me because um if I stumble across something um I could also choose to to kind of stop basically um engaging with that uh I, I know that it can be difficult for certain people who um, kind of associate, uh, you know, basically the hijab is like a really, really, um, you know, is, is a particular um, garment that is, is to express modesty. So I can understand if people feel that it's, um, you know, uh, this, it, it should be adorned a certain way. Um, but I think the distinction is that I'm not trying to ever be a spokesperson for Muslims at all. I'm just trying to be me. I think that's really important. Um, 
even Dave Chappelle, who's a comedian, is a Muslim, but he he doesn't ever like deliberately try to get into conversations about religion because he's like, I'm a human being, I am me, I make mistakes, and I don't want to tarnish something that's really beautiful and pure. Um, and I think that's where sometimes people struggle if they have that view of me uh, or what they think I should be, um, and then they see something that isn't in um, kind of line with that. But, um, you know, I, I did include some of the feedback, if you like, <laughs> that I got um, for the article. And I do think that, like, you know, people are entitled to their views. But, like, I guess it was because I was thinking along two lines. One, I think some of the readers would be curious. So I thought I'd just, you know, answer that question to being helpful. <laughs> but also, again, it's just like I've pretty much heard it all. So, uh, you know, um, maybe maybe this is something new and people can engage with it and, and who, who want to. There, I think it's obvious at this point in our conversation that there is no one thing that can be done by individuals or society that's going to make all of the complexities of love, sex and relationships in a, a British Indian Muslim female context or any other completely poof, disappear overnight. I do think better sex education in schools would be one factor that could, could help in some ways. Um, I thought a lot reading your book about whether some of the current campaigns about sex ed maybe suffer from similar problems to white feminism, where they kind of um, shout about a quite Western idea of liberation and, and a, a very a, a particular um, approach to sex without really um, taking into account uh, with sufficient sensitivity how that might be harder for people from different backgrounds or, or what they might need. Um, when you had sex ed at school, which I know involved putting condoms on bunts and burners, <laughs> and a literal short hour away for them not to work, um, I know that there was no mention of female desire or arousal. Ugh. But was there any mention of faith? You know, was there, was there any discussion of how what you were hearing at home might affect the rest of your love life? No, I think the problem here, Alex, is that there's just you just, I was surrounded by expectation and um, other people's expectations, you know, my family's expectations to, to not um, display too much uh, knowledge of those matters. And then society's expectations to know everything about sex. Um, and then male expectation to, to know how to please a man. And then um, no, no speak or talk about my own um, kind of education, if you like, or, you know, what, what I owe to myself in terms of being able to um, kind of be aroused or, or feel pleasure. It was, it was, yeah. So I think that that is really key. And also just to mention that when it comes to sex education, that there isn't a one size fits all culture, yeah. culturally or not. And, and I think that there shouldn't be that pressure. And I think that there usually is when it comes to young people that they need to be up to scratch to be cool, or they need to. And I think that everyone can get there in their own time, if that's where they want to be. Um, but I think that that type of pressure doesn't help anything because it can feel a bit rushed, it can feel awkward, it can feel uncomfortable, it can make you feel more alone if you're not getting further along. Um, so yeah, it is really, really important because um, it just wasn't something that I I felt I uh, I didn't know how to kind of like learn about it as well um, or what to learn. Um, and then if I'm learning about this thing that I'm not allowed to have, how does that even work out? Do you know what I mean? Like, I don't want to even do that. That's like learning about space and then not getting to go to Mars. <laughs> <laughs> when all you really wanted to do was go to the moon and back with the right guy. Um, <laughs> Are you aware of, and, and I really don't want to um, contradict myself by treating um, Muslims as a monolith here, but are you aware of any, what you would consider more progressive sex education resources or groups out there that speak to some Muslim experiences? Um, I haven't looked them up and I'm, I'm sure that there must be, so I apologise, um, but I know that there are, 
um, in terms of if people need people to speak to uh, for other things or just in general advice that there are I've seen quite a few like Muslim women or Muslim youth helplines so I'm, I, I think that there are resources but I think that it's definitely an area where more investment um, or growth could, could benefit a lot of people just so that um, no question is too stupid right Alex and I think no. that's what, <laughs> I think often people again going back to what I said earlier is people people unfortunately think that something's happening just to them like if if you have pain during sex for example but that's um you all know the term for that I, I forget but like there's that's a real thing and it's not uncommon so it's just so that people um can identify things sooner and then maybe help themselves so that it doesn't become um you know a lifelong issue when it doesn't have to be I am not the right person to speak to whether what resources are good in this way because uh, I don't have the cultural background to know whether they're going to chime or not. Um, I do know there's a website called Amalia um, that seems really interesting to me that talks about sexual stuff within this framework. Why does that framework is? Um, I want to just return to what you said there about pain during sex because uh, maybe... I know that this doesn't uh, refer to you, obviously, um, but actually some of the emotions that you report in Sex Bomb, like as a younger person feeling separation anxiety uh, about the fear of potentially being married off and being sent away from your family and um, fearing change because maturing and growing older meant that, um, you know, all the it, it put you at risk potentially of of, <laughs> of lots of lots of things that seem scary to you um there's a condition called vaginismus which is where the the vaginal muscle the muscles in the vagina involuntarily clamp shut that, and that means that penetration with a penis a tampon a, a, a finger whatever you want to try and put up there uh, is painful to the point of almost impossibility and there's lots of things that cause that but I have heard from women of lots of different backgrounds who have similar stories about feeling really frightened about growing up because the prospect of sex and relationships and marriage and maturing just filled them with so much foreboding because they didn't know what was going to happen. Um, I wondered if those were conversations that you maybe had with people yourself, too. Where, sad, where sad, fear of sex and, and lack of knowledge of sex is actually causing a sexual dysfunction. Well, sadly, I think it just led to um, a little bit of shaming from Ray J if, if I wasn't um, quote unquote up for it. And I think... Um, I think for me, I think what I, the conversation I wish I had had um, earlier would, was that I know that for me to enjoy sex, I need to have an emotional connection with a man. Mm -hmm. And um, I think a lot of the times when um, it was it was less fun, if you like, is, is when I was longing for that during sex, but not getting that. Um, and so physically, it, it may well have kind of transpired if you like but it was still there was something missing in it for me and um I wasn't wrong for for wanting that or or that was a need and it was you know it wasn't met and so uh, I think it's really really useful to have these conversations so that people just at least know that oh that's a thing because they you know if it's just happening um you often kind of rationalize it off like oh you know um I don't know people just might might think of a reason but um it's definitely not a conversation I had with anybody because I think sometimes, you know, you're expected to be like, oh, my God, I had such, I had my back blown out. I had a great uh -huh. session. You know, you have those conversations. Right. And when you're like really like having the, the best sex, whatever. But um, when it doesn't quite go, it's just less of a appealing story to some people. But I think there's a uh, importance in it so that you can kind of just have better sex. Right. Yeah, talking about sex when it hasn't really been all that sexy is definitely harder, but I, I hope things are, are getting easier. Um, one thing that you do mention, I keep saying one thing, one thing. Um, <laughs> you mentioned the idea that trying things and experimenting and exploring uh, is something that's rewarded in Western culture. Kissing a frog. Uh, is seen as a way of uh, its character building, whereas in it, some Asian cultures, it's seen as character destroying. 
Um, with everything that you've been through, the highs, the lows, yes, the lessons, but very hard earned and learned ones, do you think that there are some things that you can only learn through experience? And if so, how can we insulate and prepare ourselves so that those frog snogs are more constructive than destructive in our lives? Yeah, I think that um, it maybe it goes back to expectations. So when we're growing up and we learn about the fairy tale with Cinderella and we, the, you know, that amazing Prince Charming who saves her, um, we we don't learn about heartbreak. And I think most people in life sadly um, do get their heart broken at one stage or another whether it's in a relationship with a person or, or some through some other form of um, incident if you like so I think that it's really hard to know how much reality to dose somebody but um, we just have to be going, I think it nicely picks up from what we were just talking about in terms of having more real conversations um, not just about the good sex but the, you know the, the other type of sex but yeah I think that we in terms of to be stronger if you know that that's a possibility you you might guard yourself more and I think Sometimes for me growing up, um, hearing the the kind of, uh, it was really in vogue um, where April, I think, was the one who said, you need to love yourself before anybody can love you. And I just, it didn't resonate with me. Um, I think it's really important and I've grown to believe um, how important it is because if you don't love yourself, ultimately you're going to do really stupid things to try and um, love yourself uh, in under the guise of trying to get somebody else's love. So mm. whilst it's important, I think um, we need to be able to kind of, I don't know, tap into ourselves so that it speaks to us or that we're attuned with that um, and our relationship with ourselves. rather than, yeah, I, I think it's just, we put a lot of emphasis on successful external relationships, but um, I think that's why I find a lot of your material so uh, honest and raw and helpful is because you do you're very very ahead of the curve um, and you talk about self-care and you talk about these things that um, unfortunately we don't talk enough about. I try to I'm, I'm I also try really hard to make sure that I just don't think there is one way of prescribing as we've discussed at length <laughs> a one size fits all approach um there's all there's all sorts of lessons that we can learn and and mm. we have to we have to we have to try and find the thing that fits us best don't we although yeah. that's difficult when we're changing emotional shape so 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 often um I feel like a lot of my questions and our discussions here have been quite complicated and amorphous but I think that's because sex and love and relationships with ourselves and other people are complicated and amorphous. They're, they 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 don't um, always follow a set route. It's very difficult to, as much as we'd love to, to apply set rules that will make everything easier for us. Um, speaking of processes, which can sometimes be tricky, let's talk about actually the process of writing the book. Um, how did you approach it? Uh, did, did any surprises come up along the way? Um, who and what helped you? Because this is your first, this is your first book. Yeah, so um, big, big thanks and shout out to my editor, um, Katie Packer at Headline. Uh, I, I'm so, so lucky to have met her online during the pandemic. Um, she was tweeting and then I responded and we, I kind of like pitched the uh, Metro article uh, as, a, as a concept for the book. And then she was really patient with me. Um, it's obviously changed so much since that initial chat, but to be able to speak to somebody about this idea who gets it and, and didn't question it or try to change it or try to reshape it into something that it wasn't uh, or, or kind of a profitable venture, if you like. Um, I feel so fortunate to be able to work with her. She's been really patient. She helped me a lot because... I think um, I was like, I want to write this in a month and get this out. And she was like, uh, yeah, exactly. That, that's not how this stuff works, buddy. I'm like, what? I love your ambition. I, work, I love your ambition. I'm, I'm Asian. I work really hard. I'm gonna, <laughs> I should have 10 books out in a year. No. Um, so she's been super patient. And then like just helping me at various stages, getting different and um, developmental eyes on it, editors and whatever you want to, you know, who like loads of people just to kind of, uh, See how it's progressing so she's been helpful um I think giving it space as well um and yeah just uh I know this is like a really cringy phrase but I'm peeling the onion right it's um, mm -hmm. kind of like looking at things and then is this honest enough um 
uh, I just wanted it to be authentic. And um, I think, yeah, I just wanted it to, to kind of reflect some of the kind of, you know, the, the basically the journey that I've been on. You absolutely achieved all of those aims. I actually, I have a whole list of quotes from your book that I want to kind of turn into posters, which is the most white girl feminist activist no, thing I could probably, oh, I could probably you. do. You should do that. Um, That's really kind. I'd love you to do that. <laughs> I'm just trying to find where they're, oh, um, the ones that really, like these lines just stuck in my mind, like you'd covered them in a combination of Velcro glue and honey and just lob them at my fonts. The idea that feminism seems like it's a Barney between white men and women just... I, oh, I totally agree with you. It, that encapsulates so much of, of what I've felt. Um, and the idea that the concept of feminism often feels more important to women than the way we actually treat each other in real life. Um, I, I mean, I could, I could go on. There's so many great lines from this book. Um, let's return to, though, those ugly sisters. Um, you talk about how the ugly sisters are the ones who um, are doing things their way. They're not getting married off to a strange, handsome prince who everybody <laughs> approves of. They're not conforming to um, aesthetic standards of beauty, and they're remaining independent and single. I wondered if you actually could write that as a book for younger people. I think I think there's something in that. I think so. I think maybe I can't be the only one who thought. Um, you know obviously part of them did want to get picked in I shouldn't probably say uh -huh. that but, yeah, yeah. but you, you know I, I do think that there was a level of radicalism to to their um, kind of ownership of, of the, themselves and I think that there's space for more than one story and I think that's the issue is that we've all had like very linear or just like limited stories but there's room for inclusion really is like including many many stories I think um, what is next for you? What's next on the agenda? Well, listen, Alex, if I could get some dick, if I could get no, <laughs> if, if uh, right now I'm super single, I have my book launch next week and um, there's, I have no date. So it's, it's hard to write a book, but it's harder to get dick. Not just any dick, though. You need the dick to be attached to somebody who is worthy of <laughs> being inside you emotionally and physically. Mm. I really don't want this to sound trite, but during our conversation and during my multiple readings of Sex Bomb, I just really wanted to tell you that you are very easy to love. Oh, um, thank you. And you, you referred earlier to yourself as carrying, like being heavier, being heavier for, for men, being perceived as requiring more work because all of the elements that make you. You also have more wonderful weight of character to bring. You are worth so much. It's really difficult for me to express this in a way that doesn't sound so cheesy that I will just induce lactose intolerance. <laughs> no, 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 no. Um, how are you feeling about yourself now after this? this I, I, I think that <laughs> I feel like um, I'm definitely practicing more self-care. I think that that was definitely something that um, women like me, girls like me were never taught. And I think it's so important. And um, if I do meet young people or any any women or, or even men, I will, I will definitely encourage um it's so important to look after yourself it, it, and I know we, we can be really busy but we have enough time so yeah I definitely think that I'm making more time for myself sometimes that means doing things I don't want to do like going to the gym but sometimes I do want to go to the gym so you know it's just um making doing things that uh sometimes is outside of the schedule if you like so you're putting yourself first I'm trying, not all the time, but yeah, it's, it's, it's still, you know, I definitely, I'm definitely trying. Yeah, it's, it's, it's definitely more on my radar than, than ever before, for sure. Well, I'm guessing that we should probably um, treat things like a highly uh, religiously um, incongruous Christmas present right now and wrap them up. Um, I maybe wanted to just leave people with the line that closes your book um without knowing that our sexuality is ours to control it makes it easier for it to be used for and by others 
Sadia, can you tell me a bit more about what's on your fuck it bucket list of must do sexual adventures that you want to have, apart from joining the Mile High Club, which, as you acknowledge, is quite difficult for uh, Muslim women to do <laughs> anything on planes that may draw attention to themselves. Have you got any fresh plans to kind of make? And, and your... Unless it's with the pilot, Alex. Unless. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, I dated a pilot. I got dropped from many thousands of feet. I don't recommend it. Oh British on fairways. <laughs> wow. Because they can like in the cockpit anyway, never mind. Um he was a cock and the pits, unfortunately. Uh, <laughs> I, have they, I have a much better partner now. Good. I'm so pleased to hear that. And I know you're you're very happy, so um, hence why I wasn't too concerned. Um I, 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 uh, <laughs> I well, that, that is a noise that we make during sex sometimes. <laughs> it can be good or bad. <laughs> There's a lot I would love to try. Um, yeah, just lots to try, really. I, I mean, outdoors would be fun. Um, you outdoors know. will full stop after the last two yeah. years. <laughs> yeah, 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 <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. in, in the fresh sure. air with anyone. <laughs> Outdoors would be good. And I think, yeah, I just think, uh, you know, with the right partner, I think you can kind of like feel the vibe with one another and like see where you can kind of push things, if that makes sense. But like, yeah, I, I don't know, man. I just, I, I'm hoping that the person is not a fuck boy. That's, that's all I can hope for. I think you have um, attuned your fuck boy senses now, though. Um, you're, you're a lot more you're a lot better at sussing those people out than you were previously and <laughs> maybe able to draw conclusions to look after yourself a little a little bit faster I hope so yeah yeah I think so I'm hoping for fewer frogs and toads and more unusual surprising wondrous um if not princes um no kings in your life wow oh my god bring on the kings bring on the kings yes um well sadia the sex bomb disposal unit have now arrived to shut down our uh-huh. conversation it's it's definitely a heat seeking missile i would think um it has been an absolute treasured pleasure on multiple multiple layers to talk to you today um how could, do, can people get their hands and their glands on this book? So um, it's available by Audible and you can find it on um, Headline, Amazon, WH Myth, Waterstones, Foils, all your good bookstores. Um, I would love you to read it. I've put a lot of work into it and um, thank you for watching. It has truly been wonderful uh, to, to chat with you. And um, the fact that I am lost for words says a whole lot. Um, <laughs> Me too. This book. Yeah, either that or I'm just pretending to have my mouth full with something else possibly dick <laughs> <laughs> yeah is that a stick or are you just pleased to see me <laughs> it has been very phallic throughout this chat hasn't it? <laughs> <laughs> sadia asma an absolute wonder 